thank you, Lorenzo, and thank you to you and the other organizers for the kind invitation today. But I'm simply Massimo, and uh, I'm a physician. I generally try to spend uh, uh, the morning uh, in the hospital and the afternoon in the lab, and this is what I've been, uh, what I did in the last uh, 30 years, more or less, after my uh, degree in medicine. Now, uh, Lorenzo and, uh, asked me just to um, make some thoughts about uh, unmet needs in clinical medicine, specifically in my field, uh, so non-communicable diseases. And uh, I decided to start from this uh, uh, picture from a recent uh, review by a geneticist involved in type 2 diabetes, uh, uh, Simon, Simon Griffin. And uh, um, just reflecting on the fact that uh, in internal medicine in non-communicable disease area, uh, we are uh, moving from the one size fits all medicine, the same pill to treat uh, uh, a lot of disorders, uh, maybe aspirin for thrombosis, for inflammation, for many other things. Uh, we uh, passed uh, uh, during the age of stratification, so we learned how to stratify the risk and the uh, risk of complications and development of disease in, in, uh, in patients, uh, arriving to stratified medicine. And we are now moving to personalization, the new obsession of the uh, clinicians. Uh, we want to uh, land on the uh, country of precision medicine and make uh, um, the use of omics technologies as much as possible. Is it uh, possible, really? We will discuss this. First, however, uh, let's consider one point that is important, that will be important for the discussion with me now and probably with many of the other speakers. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure you can see, but these are the principles for non-communicable disease prevention and control established by uh, some colleagues in a recent review published in uh, uh, Nature Medicine. And the last point is leveraging digital health technologies and non-physician health workforce to deliver person-centered care. Uh, I call this the new obsession in the field of clinician, clinical medicine. I'm not sure that we will be able really uh, to deliver person-centered care, uh, but we need discussion about this. Another important point that we need to uh, think about uh, uh, omics and uh, this new era of precision medicine is time. Uh, time is probably the most important variable uh, to take into account in clinical practice uh, and also in clinical research. Um, there was a review published, uh, um, a perspective published by this colleague, Len Fan, in 2003, and he established this concept of the 17-year gap uh, as a unifying challenge for translational research and uh, raison d'etre for implementation in science. Basically, you need 17 years uh, to uh, translate a discovery into clinical practice. In 2021, another study on cancer control uh, just uh, uh, commented that we moved from 70 year, a 17 year gap to 15 years gap. So it's not that much of improvement in, uh, after 20 years of, of practice. Now, uh, what we will discuss, unmet needs in non-communicable diseases. Uh, first, precision and personalized medicine, the homics revolution and the slowness towards translation in clinical practice, the first point. And then the, 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 another important point in internal medicine and NCDs, the challenge of multimorbidity. And uh, these two uh, topics uh, are, uh, um, maybe I can say that uh, are one against the other, I will try to explain. And uh, here we are trying to go into very precision pathways to uh, diversify uh, each patient, any, any uh, person in this, uh, in this uh, um, room has a different uh, risk for uh, uh, diseases. On the other uh, hand, uh, we are going back to the one size fits for all because of economic costs and sustainability of the health system uh, to treat uh, uh, older people. Now let's start with the first one. Uh, definition of personalized medicine. Uh, 
the use of diagnostic and screening methods to better manage the individual patient's disease or predisposition toward the disease. And uh, this was established by the NIH strategic planning, the Heart, Lung, Blood Institute specifically. Uh, they were really convinced, uh, it was 15 years ago, personalized medicine will enable risk assessment, diagnosis, prevention, and therapy specifically tailored to the unique characteristics of the individual, thus enhancing the quality of life and public health. Well, this is probably true, but I think that the road is still long. And uh, uh, in, in the concept, uh, well, uh, just if we think to the uh, precision medicine parad paradigm, let's start from the clinical medicine. In the clinical medicine, what we need as clinicians is to make diagnosis, to treat the patients, and maybe to work also on health outcomes in the general population. Uh, we did uh, this job in the last uh, thousands of years uh, by a reductionist point of view. One symptom, one variable, one disease. For instance, uh, I'm quite an expert of type 2 diabetes, blood glucose. We do the diagnosis of diabetes and we treat the disease based on uh, uh, blood glucose. Although diabetes has a lot of different effects on metabolism, which are, cannot be in some way reduced to uh, uh, blood glucose. Still, uh, many of uh, my, my colleagues uh, only look at glucose when uh, treat patients. Uh, Things are, cha are changed by the new approaches, possibly, new diagnostics, therapies, and technologies, and new practices that are exemplified by the concept of omics. Exposome, genome, genomics, epigenomics, uh, uh, metagenomics, microbiome, uh, all uh, um, technologies that uh, can uh, give us a lot of information that, however, uh, need uh, computing sciences uh, and uh, uh, interaction with data scientists. And this is where is the first problem. Uh, the clinical work world is not ready to uh, use these technologies in the clinical practice. I will show something, but this is the, probably the first uh, node that needs to be solved by experts in uh, bioinformatics, technology, and, and so on. Now, um, in the last uh, 20 years, uh, you can go in PubMed, you will see that we have plenty of publications on genomics, epigenomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, metagenomics, and so on. These are very informative methods. We use this in the lab. I will show some, some data uh, to uh, stratify patients and to um, try to learn about the different uh, subphenotypes in certain chronic conditions. And uh, certainly, uh, this is a, so, um, a, a really an improvement in our method. In the past, uh, we only had macro level testing uh, simply based on clinical symptoms. Today, we have some molecular level testing, which allows us to differentiate some phenotypes inside pathologies, tumors, uh, cancers, uh, or even uh, NCDs. And the future is certainly predictive testing, which may be predictive in primary prevention, so you are healthy and you don't need you need simply to understand your risk to develop a, uh, a disease, or you have a disease and you need to, uh, in the secondary prevention and tertiary prevention field, you need to um, understand what are the risks for developing complications of the disease. Uh, and we do this by, or we may, we will be able to do this by uh, analyzing uh, uh, biofluids like blood, saliva, and so on, uh, changing our approach or trying to analyze exposome, epigenome, microbiome, metabolome, uh, simply changing our perspective so we leave the uh, reductionist uh, um, uh, approach, so one variable, one disease, and we look at, for instance, uh, uh, all the metabolites in the blood of a uh, a patient with type 2 diabetes to understand whether he is controlled and whether the defects is more on glucose metabolism or on lipid metabolism. However, as always, we exaggerate. And uh, uh, when I started my uh, career as a, let's say, translational scientist uh, after uh, my degree in 1995, it was the apoptosis era and uh, the apoptosis age. 
everything was apoptosis, okay? So we studied apoptosis in every kind of process, even in processes where apoptosis was really nothing. Today, uh, we are obsessed by omics, okay? So we have proteomics, cellular genomics, bibliomics, biomics, cardiogenomics, cellomics, chemogenomics, chemoproteomics, chromatinomics, chromos chromonomics, chromosomics, is different, <laughs> combinatorial peptidomics, computational RNOmics, which is not genomics, okay, or functional genomics, is different, cryobionomics, and then crystallomics, cetochromics, cytomics, degradomics, and so on. So, uh, uh, fragonomics, I, I still need to understand what is, but is, is, uh, it maybe could be interesting. Now, this is just to let you know that uh, uh, we don't need to exaggerate. We need, we need to extract the useful things for the clinical practice, and we'll try to make some explanation. And the other problem is, uh, what is the price of this kind of effort? Uh, clinicians, as, as I told you, clinicians and non-medical health workers are not trained to understand omics. This is something that we need absolutely to introduce in, uh, in, in the MD and PhD courses uh, devoted to biomedical sciences. Maybe uh, it's different in the US or in other countries, but at least here we, have, we are facing some complications. And uh, the volume of data in, in zettabytes is increasing. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, in 2025, we have this number, 181 zettabytes, something that only Amazon will be able to manipulate. And this is why Amazon has entered the health uh, market and is buying a lot of uh, uh, companies in the United States and in the world. Now, uh, the problem with the, the homics approach is that we can, even in the, con in, the, in, the, in the homics world, we can be reductionist or not. Reductionist is, I use only, only one omics to understand how I can implement um, uh, the life of a patient, uh, and I will make an example. But today, uh, we need to integrate the multi-omics. So, forget the list that I showed you before, but maybe we will be able to use proteomics and metabolomics and maybe metagenomics to identify biomarkers or to unravel biological networks or to make some kind of drug discovery. And we have uh, some example of success. COPD, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, is one of these. There are several uh, papers showing that um, using com com combined use of metabolomics and uh, uh, genetics can improve the diagnosis and, the, and, the, and to target uh, the right treatment for patients. Yet, there are uh, some, some problems, uh, pitfalls and tips that we need to consider and that are linked to the fact that uh, uh, the omics technology are not ready uh, for the clinical uh, uh, practice. So it's not only the clinicians that are not ready to understand the clinical, the homics, but also the homics that need some uh, changes. Um, for instance, uh, uh, there are very different, uh, there are many differences between, uh, across platforms and assays, so they are not uniformed, and this is uh, uh, an enemy for the clinical practice. In the clinical practice, we need that everything is the same. Other, otherwise, if you do uh, a test uh, in Dusseldorf uh, and is different uh, as the one made here in Forli or Cesena, I can say that what is done the, here is not reliable for the colleagues in Germany and vice versa. And this is a problem if uh, we need to treat the same patient. Uh, another problem is that uh, uh, we need to integrate the data. And the data integration is more statistics rather than uh, clinical work. And so we need the help of statisticians and we need the help of data scientists to make this integration, uh, let's say, to um, allow us to understand, us, I, I mean the clinicians, to understand the power and the meaning of the omics uh, uh, um, technologies. And we also uh, have... The, the problem that uh, um, there are some, uh, let's say, uh, legal aspects uh, in uh, data collection, 
that are very, very important. And I call this uh, uh, the hypocrisy of data protection because uh, we want to explore in depth our biology. At the same time, we don't want uh, that other may have a benefit from uh, the, 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 the data that are collected uh, in, in me, in myself, or other, other people. Uh, some examples. Uh, this is uh, probably uh, the most uh, uh, ready for clinical use uh, uh, omics technology, uh, polygenic risk score based on uh, uh, genome-wide um, association studies, a collection of variants in the genome of individuals that uh, then are uh, um, in some way integrated uh, to form or uh, to, to calculate uh, a risk score based on multiple genes. Why, this is why it's called polygenic. And I can use the polygenic risk score, for instance, to differentiate controls from cases. So a polygenic risk score may help me to understand whether uh, the guy in front of me is uh, uh, affected by, potentially affected by uh, cancer in the future, or maybe Alzheimer or uh, type 2 diabetes, or in the case of uh, inside uh, uh, the pathology, whether uh, uh, the, the, the risk of the subject is very low, medium, or high to develop complications, for instance, in type 2 diabetes. Uh, this is obviously very uh, helpful uh, with some, uh, however, problems. Sim Simon Griffin, oh, that is a geneticist, and uh, incredibly he is against uh, this the, the whole thing of omics, um, commented that the proponents of polygenic risk scores stress their value in identifying high-risk individuals from birth. Uh, but you can consider the counterfactual. Would you advise the parents of a baby with a low lifetime risk of diabetes that is safe for their child to be sedentary, to consume an unhealthy diet and become overweight? Clearly not. So it is we need, we need to understand how to use the polygenic risk score and how to make a, a right use of omics technology. <laughs> However, we are learning. For instance, in this case, a recent paper published in type 1 diabetes uh, field, uh, and uh, this is a prediction model for distinguishing individuals from type 1 diabetes from healthy controls, and uh, based on uh, metagenomics, on the gut microbiome. And uh, uh, this is very useful because the gut microbiome, we are still learning how to um, use the gut microbiome in the, in the clinical field, but you can see that you can predict type 1 diabetes uh, with the gut microbiome, which um, is helpful for diagnosis in uh, high-risk individuals and may be helpful in the future because the gut microbiome can be manipulated with diets and drugs. Uh, we are still, let's say, learning in, in, in the infancy of our uh, uh, understanding of uh, how to uh, use the gut microbiome. But for diseases like uh, type 1 diabetes, uh, this is a sort of uh, revolutionary um, discovery. This is another example. Uh, it's coming from a, a, a research exercise from my lab. Uh, here you can uh, see how atherosclerosis that is lesion size, is connected to diet and to bacteria like Lacnospiraceae, Ruminococcaceae, Porphyrodorminaceae, um, and, and many other. And uh, this may be useful because uh, you can establish that the same uh, um, pathways are uh, um, maybe shown in patients uh, with uh, atherosclerosis. So I know that the gut microbiome is in some way affecting uh, the development of a disease like atherosclerosis in human subjects and another uh, site of possible site of intervention. Uh, Again, another possible use of the homics technology. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, it is clear that we can appreciate how combining, uh, integrating the, the homics is better than use only one. Um, this is a prediction of uh, uh, nafol D uh, in obese uh, women. Nafol D is no alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, today, the term has changed. Now we call it. Uh, a metabolic associated uh, uh, steatotic liver disease because we avoid several stigma. And this is something that has emerged in the last two weeks, so I didn't correct the, the slide. But 
um, if we use only clinical um, variables, uh, we um, have a very low power to um, predict the disease. Uh, 59%, even if we um, add other uh, more intensive uh, challenging uh, uh, variants like uh, make an oral glucose tolerance test in people with this fatty liver. What if I add urinary metabolome? We jump to 69% uh, of predicting score. If I use the plasma metabolome, uh, 79. Uh, if I use the metagenome, uh, 72. Uh, and if I use a combination of them, I go to 87, meaning that I can avoid liver biopsy in a lot of individuals. And liver biopsy is an invasive test that has some risk, bleeding, and uh, uh, can be, uh, uh, it is useful to avoid this. Now, uh, there are many other examples, and uh, one important point, the road to clinical omics is still uh, uh, long, Efforts must be done to intensify the cross-talk between health workers and data scientists, but can be useful to stratify at-risk people in several conditions. Second point, multimorbidity, the new pandemic in the Western countries. Again, if you go to your general practitioner, no, you are too young, but if I go to my general practitioner, he can tell, you, he can tell me, okay, you have to lose weight, uh, monitor diabetes, I don't have diabetes, but let's say monitor diabetes, hypertension, uh, and, and again. So I go to the diabetologist, I go to the hypertensiologist, I can go to an expert in cardiology, and so on. The only problem is that a lot of people, at least those that are in my uh, inpatient unit, is affected by uh, these uh, conditions uh, altogether. So we are facing a lot of patients, and this is probably the effect of healthy aging for a, a lot of time in, in the life, but 70 years old people may be problem, cardiovascular problem, may, be metabo have, uh, may have metabolic problem, respiratory problems, and we call this multimorbidity. And since we are good as clinicians, these people, they live but they live with disability for a lot of years. And this is a problem because disability has a lot of economic costs for health systems. Now, why? We, are still, we still need to understand. There are people, a colleague saying that multimorbidity, uh, um, there are common pathways to explain the onset of these diseases altogether. There are other people that are simply uh, suggesting that it's a chance that you develop uh, all these different conditions uh, in, in the same patients. So we need probably more uh, studies on multimorbid uh, courts to understand this point. Uh, yet, if you look at the multimorbidity in different uh, ages, you see that there are multimorbidity, uh, evidence of multimorbidity in the uh, infection world in the pediatric age. Uh, there are effect, uh, evidence of multimorbidity in the metabolic field, uh, in the whole adult life, or in the, uh, let's say, going towards uh, uh, um, geriatric age, uh, um, and with, with many other uh, um, morbid, uh, uh, morbidities altogether. Simply saying that the, we have multimorbidity that is different in the pediatric age and multimorbidity that is different in the adult age. So we, the, the idea that there is a common pathway, it's, uh, um, I, I don't think it's really um, sustainable by these uh, clinical evidences. Um, but one problem of multimorbidity is that we are leaving uh, the precision medicine. Uh, what are the actions to do to meet the unmet needs of multimorbidity? Maintenance of general, generalist skills, so it's again specialization, or clusters like instead of personalization. This is cluster. One size fits all, again. So we need to identify mechanisms that uh, can be translated in, in clinical practice and in treatment to treat uh, five, six degrees altogether with one drug. Otherwise, the patients can take 20 pills a day, which is, I mean, not really simple, and so on. Again, uh, some colleagues, uh, 
uh, are using metabolomics in this case to establish pathways in non-communicable disease multimorbidity. And there are some uh, metabolites uh, that um, differentiate the risk of multimorbidity in these patients. We still need to understand whether these metabolites may be translated in, uh, in, in clinical practice, uh, making some sort of fingerprints or signatures to uh, identify multimorbidity risk in uh, uh, middle-aged people. What is the solution? Something that you will discuss certainly in the next uh, days. Solution may be technology. Uh, this is uh, just a glimpse on the different technologies we, uh, uh, we, that are available to treat uh, uh, chronic uh, uh, disorders. Uh, and uh, we discussed yesterday a lot of them during the dinner, by the way. And uh, uh, certainly they will uh, improve uh, uh, our um, efficiency in treating disease. And then there is another aspect. This is the dream of the clinicians. Uh, move the hospital away from me. The hospital is in your home, okay? But jokes apart, uh, even in the case of a very uh, accurate geriatric healthcare in the home setting, you still need uh, patients that are trained to use all these technologies. For instance, my mother is eight years old. She's in, in good shape. Uh, she has a degree in biology and a PhD in uh, plant physiology. I don't think she will be able to, um, let's say, handle uh, the health monitoring, the IE voice assistant, uh, an artificial pancreas technology, and so on. You must be trained. Probably this is, will be for your generation, not for my generation. Uh, and another point is that if we go to uh, look at the data, believe the data, at the moment, uh, uh, we don't have evidence that uh, digital self-management program uh, is doing better than the classical approach in uh, um, uh, managing uh, multiple chronic diseases. And this is a recent paper from, uh, published in JAMA and Open Network uh, suggesting that uh, the difference is not significant between the two uh, kind of treatment, but the court is really uh, small, 116 patients uh, treated with the internet-based chronic disease management system against uh, 133, uh, 113 in the usual care. So uh, take home questions in this case. Uh, is the multimorbidity pandemic a fashion or really correlated to an healthy aging? We'll see. Is home-centered healthcare for older people sustainable? Just think of the costs of uh, equipment maintenance and so on. And how omics a good diagnostic prognostic to identify common targets to treat multimorbidity? If there will be another uh, symposium like this one in the next years, maybe we will have some answer. Just remember uh, an old sentence from William Hosler, that is the founder of modern medicine, uh, living, he lived uh, in, in uh, um, Baltimore and Oxford. Uh, and Canada more than 100 years ago, it is much more important to know what sort of a patient has a disease than what sort of disease a patient has. And this is a central in the activity uh, of the clinicians uh, today. So thank you for your attention.